Shall we begin? begin this ending symposium, and I uh, agreed to do so. Um, let me begin by saying that there are many opportunities for further work in the ethics of care. Let me mention a few. First, as is in the packet that you received and there are flyers there, the Care Ethics Research Consortium was founded at the University of Humanistic Studies in the Netherlands this year and it's an open research consortium. If you are not a member, the addresses are there, but you could also email me and I can make sure that you get um, attached to the group. They will have a conference, we will have a conference in late September in Portland, Oregon, which should be lovely and lots of fun, and Eva Kite will be the keynote speaker there. Tula Bradley, who was here earlier today, and apologizes that she had to leave, tells me that she is definitely, absolutely, for sure, creating a foundation for ethics of care. I said, how shall I call it? She said, I don't know. I said, well, I'll call it the FEC then. And if you're interested, you should email uh, Tula, or again, email me, and I'll put you in touch with Tula. There are two journals that are really worth thinking about if you want to publish your work in the ethics of care. The first, the International Journal of Care and Caring, has just started last year um, in its first episode. I'm happy to say, uh, I'm flattered to say uh, they asked me to publish a piece, and I did, a piece on neoliberalism, a, critique, a care ethics critique of neoliberalism. You should be able to get the journal, but if not, write to me and I'll send you a copy of this uh, essay. We're very interested in having ethics of care essays, and Maurice Hamilton is already organizing a special issue on care ethics. It looks as if about once every two years there will be a special issue about care ethics in the journal. Also, the journal Ethics and Social Welfare is now 10 years in existence, and they have published a number of pieces on ethics of care. And they, in fact, will hold a meeting in a conference in early September next year in the UK, uh, again, to, to bring together care ethics research. So there's a lot, I mean, we really have created an international movement of people who are interested in these questions. There are people, as I said at the beginning, in Australia, in South America, North America, Asia, Europe, Africa, doing this work. And so really, hmm? and well, in, I count India as part of Asia, but, yeah, so. I count the Middle East as part of the ship, but the Middle East as well. So, so, Petro asked, began by asking us to the question, how to transform democracy into caring democracy substantively? And let me just say a few words of summary and then point in some, and raise some questions. First of all, we talked a lot about what is caring democracy, and we did that by reflecting on the meaning of care and on the meaning of democracy. In terms of care, Lisa Conradi began, or Elizabeth, I'm sorry, Professor Dr. Elizabeth Conradi, <laughs> began by telling us that there is a tension between uh, two pieces, uh, one that's more ethical and one that's more political, and often these two separate out. And what's interesting is we did see sometimes even in the course of our two days, that these two sometimes separate out. But um, there's an argument to be made for holding them together. And I think, uh, I, well, I agree with that, actually. Uh, Brunella Casalina, Casalini made a wonderful paper where she compared other feminist vocabularies to the vocabulary of care and showed us some of the ways in which these divergent feminist traditions are coming together to talk about something that seems to be the same, um, although they use different languages, and, and again, a very nice, beautiful, fine-grained analysis of those differences. And Justin Clardy yesterday talked about the relationship of tenderness or a philosophy of love as an alternative way, that's not the language of care, but it's another language that might be a useful one for us to think about these issues. 
Well, as we turn to democratic practices, there were practices that were state-oriented and practices that were not. So in terms of the state, there were several papers about bureaucracy and the welfare state. Helena um, presented a, a, a kind of a positive defense of the welfare state as an historical institution that does, in fact, care and demonstrated that not only by the, the levels of support that people get, but also by the ways that people in the public institutions themselves think about their roles. And Pedro presented a, a paper as well about the importance of using institutions as a form of structure, which allows us to provide democratic accountability in the forms of, of, of care. Citing uh, Tyranny of Structuralists, one of my favorite essays of all time, mm -hmm. by Joe Freeman, he made it clear that we, there has to be some way for us to think about structure and accountability in structure. On the other hand, many presentations talked about the state as a democratic institution, which is not very caring. Lizzie Ward's paper uh, was heartbreaking in its description of uh, what's now happening, as was Yayo and Sato's paper earlier today in describing to us how the Japanese um, structure of, and discussion about poverty just hides women's poverty, and indeed even the Constitution it is, is not safe from being turned into a more patriarchal institution in this day and age. Um, the discussions about education at the end by Viet and by Adriana, uh, by Tammy, again point to the problems of state-run institutions as ways of providing care for citizens. And we also saw other ways of thinking about how the state is not enough. Yorma presented a paper that talked about social movements as an alternative way to think about political life rather than thinking of political life starting from the state. Anna presented a paper where she talked about civil society and how we might start there rather than from the state to think about where care belongs. And Kanchana raised the very key important question that this issue of care goes beyond the boundaries even of nation states and is a global post-colonial concern that we have to take seriously. Um, in terms of care, we also had a discussion earlier today about the relationship of care and recognition. And one of the things that we talked about indirectly, but not very directly, although Adriana did mention this in her final talk, in the final talk, was the importance of diversity, of pluralism, um, and of considering people from diverse subgroups within societies, whether it's uh, Turkish families or the condition of Roma in Eastern Slovakia. Another area that was, um, I'm, you can see this is a very quick general summary, but maybe it helps sometimes just to remember how much we've done in the last two days. Uh, we also talked a fair amount, not directly, but indirectly, about what are the appropriate methods by which we should examine care and uh, there were claims made to support pragmatism, Adriana, phenomenology, Viet, uh, philosophical analysis of various forms, Lisa, uh, Brunella, Anna, for example, um, social science research and data, um, the paper about Japan, the paper about um, uh, Belgium. Uh, there were questions as well about the use of cognitive science. Justin uh, was defending that. Yorma raised questions about how privilege incapacitates people from knowledge, a kind of epistemological difficulty that people encounter. I argue that we need to start thinking perhaps more about care as a discursive practice rather than simply as a practice of care itself. And Lizzie Ward gave us a really beautiful example of how co-production might be a way to think methodologically about what we, we, what we should be doing in our work with others. Um, so how do we come closer to caring democracy? We seem all to agree we're pretty far away right now. Um, and there are many, many remaining research questions. In the first place, um, you know, 
Here's one of the questions I think we're going to have to confront in the next decade. And that's the question of how and what form of democratic practice should caring democracy take? There are now actually fair numbers of pressures on the idea that representative democracy is a system for all time and all places. And I'm very worried that the direction this is going is not a good one. That instead of substituting something more democratic, we'll substitute something much less democratic. Um, that we're about to re-enter the nightmare that was repeated, uh, repeat the century previous uh, nightmare. But, so is it that we need deliberative democracy more than representative democracy? Are there new or old modes of democratic practice, including social movements, thinking of civil society? Are there other ways for us to think about how representation can work more directly and more effectively? Second, we have to. Th I do think we need to focus more on the question of research and how to do it and whether or not co-production is the best model and whether or not there are things like um, inherent biases and the kinds of methods we used in the social sciences or in philosophy that we need to kind of unpack. Third direction, I think we need to think more about this tension in the split directions between thinking of care in political terms, thinking of it in personal or philosophical terms, and how we put these pieces together. Um, it's confusing to people, and that we should take people's confusion as a real insight into the difficulties we're having explaining something that seems perhaps to us obvious. Um, and, and then finally, I would say, to quote Chairman Mao, you'll forgive me, uh, that we need to walk on two legs. I do think that's kind of a funny saying. <laughs> and that is that we need both to continue to refine the feminist arguments for care that we are making, and that's a really important activity for us to engage in as a community. Uh, but as a research community, it's also time for us to engage broader public discussions and to say to people who haven't ever heard of care ethics, oh, well, you're missing the boat, because the feminist thinkers have been doing something really important for at least the last 30 years, and it's time for you all to catch up. Mm -hmm. um, I can't tell you how many times I've read a book review in the last couple of years, and it, or a new book, because I write these reviews myself, where the people have just absolutely ignored the feminist literature on a subject, just completely ignored it. The books on responsibility that never cite a single feminist writer, okay. You don't have to cite me, but you cannot skip by Rizal <laughs> on this question, you know? And it, it's time for us to start saying to people who, in related, cognitive, uh, related fields in philosophy, political philosophy, political theory, uh, social sciences, it's time for you to catch up, guys. You can't just ignore the feminist literature and say, oh, that's just the feminist literature any longer. So I guess the last question, what's next? <laughs> It may be, as Helena suggested yesterday, that these papers out of this conference should be put together into a volume, either as a special issue in one of these journals or as a standalone volume. Um, and um, my guess is that in my brief summary, I've missed lots of important points that you would like to raise. So I'll stop talking, and the floor is open.